Well, hey, this is an exciting Sunday at at Champion Forest. We're glad that you're here with us this morning. We're glad that you're watching online if you're online. And if you're across the campus in a life group room watching, we are glad that you are tuned in and connected as well. God is good and God is moving and we're excited about all the things that that God's done, right? And not only is it a big day here, it's a big day for, for a lot of people, a big week for a lot of people as their kiddos went back to school for the first time since March Eighth. So if you are a student and you have gone back to school this week, know that, that you have been prayed for over and over and over again all week long by your church family. Moms and dads, we have been praying for you guys as well as you help your students navigate uh, what's going on in their schools. And, and by the way, teachers and administrators, principals, we love you and are thankful for you. And we have been praying for you guys as well as you create a great experience For our kiddos. As my kids came home from school each day this week, I pulled them aside and I would always ask them the same question. Done it for years and I was really curious to hear the answers that I was going to get this week. But I'll pull them aside and say, hey guys, what was the most exciting part of your day? Right? The the thing that that captures your mind, the thing that you think about when you sum up today. And their their answers have been really good this week. Uh, It's been a great week for our family. But I pulled our four year old aside after his preschool the other day and said, hey buddy, What's the most exciting thing? And he said, Dad, you're never going to believe it. And I was sure that I wouldn't. And so I leaned in and said, tell me, buddy, what what happened? And he said, well, I was outside on the playground playing with my friend. And I said, okay, stop there. What's your friend's name? And he said, I don't know. But we're good friends, right? And so he's there with his best friend that he doesn't know his name, and they're digging on the playground. And they're digging and digging and digging in, in the sandbox that's on the playground. And he said, Dad, when I was digging, you know what I found? I found gold treasure on the playground at my my preschool. And I said, buddy, what did you do when you found the gold? And he said, dad, I put it in my pocket. (laughs) And I was was pretty proud of that, right? He put that gold in his pocket. And then him and his buddy, they kept digging and they found more and more and more gold. And and so this little treasure hunter now has a big stash of gold he's got to find something to do with. And so we talked about it. I said, what are you going to do with all the treasure that you've got? And he thought about it for a second. He said, dad, I'm going to buy a boat so I can go fishing whenever I want. And we laughed about it a little bit, and then I realized, he's serious. He he thinks that he has gold that he's going to go buy a boat with. And so he he was a little disappointed when I began to explain, listen, I, I know it was buried in the sand like treasure is. I know it looks like gold. I know it feels like gold. I know that, that it shines like gold, all of that kind of stuff. But, but the inside of this is different. Right, that the inside of this isn't pure. The inside of this isn't valuable. The inside of this isn't what you think it is. And, and buddy, I don't know how to tell you, but we're not going to be able to buy a boat with what you think is gold. Right? That what he thought was gold, what he thought was good, was not going to get him where he thought or where he expected it to get him in life. And the same thing is true as we open our Bibles today and look at the topic that we're going to find in Scripture. And if you've got your Bibles with you, I want to invite you to open up to James chapter 3. And and as we do, we're going to see James take a long, hard look at the subject or the topic of wisdom. Because the truth is this, there are a lot of people holding on very tightly. Man, they've stuck it in their pocket like my kiddo. They're holding on very tightly to wisdom that they think is from God. They think they're doing the right thing. They think that they're moving in the right direction, but by all accounts in their mind and maybe even by by the mind of the world around them, they are smart, they're intelligent, and they're going in the right direction. But there's going to be a point where they realize that what they thought was wisdom isn't going to get them where they're hoping they would go, right? It's just like that, that fool's gold. It's not the real deal, and ultimately that kind of wisdom is not from God. And we're also going to see in James chapter 3 that that there's the opposite, right? That there is a heavenly wisdom, a wisdom that was birthed in the heart of God that God graciously gives to his children that that is the real deal, that is solid, that is pure, and that will lead us and take us to to where God would have us go in life, to, to a place, and this is what God's word is going to show us, to a place of joy and peace, And so when you set these two against each other, just like if you set fool's gold and real gold against each other, and you knew all the details of it, you knew the value of both, you knew what you could get with both, you know what what both would bring to your life, what are you picking? 
Right? You're picking the real gold every single time. And so in, in these couple of verses, five or six verses here, James does that with wisdom. He says, hey, here's, here's earthly wisdom, and here's where it's going to take you. You might think it's good, but, but you're going to end up in chaos and sin. And here's godly wisdom. Right? And this really is good, and it really is from God the Father. And you know where it's going to get you? To a life of righteousness, joy, and peace. He just lays it out there so that you and I, as people reading the word of God, can latch on to the right thing. And my hope and my prayer this morning is this, is that as we open up God's word and just look at the, these short, simple verses, that, that we would allow God's word to cause us to take an honest look at our lives, right? No matter where we're at, where we're, we're doing right now, to see if, in fact, that we are living lives that are driven by godly wisdom to do what God's called us to do. And if we are, if that's what God's word shows us this morning, my prayer is that the response is, thank you, God, for the wisdom that, that you have given me to the live according to your word, and that, that we would rally around other people to help them pursue this godly wisdom as well. But the opposite is true as well. If we open up God's word and we see, hey, you know what, man, I, I thought that I've been doing the right thing. I thought that I've been moving in the right direction. Everybody around me sort of is giving me the pat on the back saying that, that we're moving along at the right pace. But God's word this morning is showing me that, that what I'm holding on to tightly is wisdom or a, a plan for my life really is in fact fool's gold. And my prayer is that if anybody would, would sense that this morning, that we would just let go and that, and that we would turn and pursue godly wisdom. In fact, that's our first point if you're taking notes. Uh, it, it's, it's simply this, that we would pursue godly wisdom. Every single one of us is called to that, no matter how old we are, if we're 6 or 60 or anywhere in between, we're called to pursue godly wisdom. Look at uh, verse 13 of James chapter 3. The Bible says this, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. So that this big concept of wisdom, James opens up with a rhetorical question. He's done it before in the book of James, and his goal when he opens with questions like this is to get his readers, the, those first century Christians, and us today, we're included in that, right, is to get his readers thinking. And so today, let's think, let's engage with that question. Who, who is wise in understanding among you. And so James might have been trying to get his readers to think about, okay, who are people that I would consider wise? Who are people that have it all together that maybe I can model my life after and think through? But James is also trying to maybe stir something up with them to where somebody would raise their hand and say, you know what? That's me, right? I'm, I'm pretty wise, right? I, I, I'm, I'm educated. I, I read the paper. I, I check out the Wall Street Journal every day. I watch the news. I'm always up to date with the latest memes on Facebook that give me factual, true information, right? So he, he's hoping that somebody says, that's me. I'm smart. I've, I've got it together. And, and so then he takes it a step farther. And when somebody says that, the, the end of his sentence, he says this, okay, you think you're smart. You think that you're wise. I want to ask you to prove it. And the cool thing is this. Here's the catch. You don't prove your wisdom with what you know. James says, I want you to prove the wisdom that is in your life by how you live your life. Look at the end of the verse. By his good conduct, let him show it, right? Good works with humility. James is trying to change how they and how you and I view wisdom. It's not this accumulation of information that's going to be on a test one day. Wisdom, it's proven and how we live. And we need to make sure that, that we understand that, right? Because in our world, it's just a little bit different. In our world, there's so many articles, books, blogs, TED Talks, all of these different sources of information out there, and their design, their intention is, is to try to help us gain what the world would call wisdom or understanding. And in fact, I feel like our world has this picture of what the world should think wisdom looks like. Think about any movie or TV show or book cover. Well, what does a smart person look like? They all look the same. Every movie, every TV show. What's a smart person look like? Glasses. I heard glasses. Yeah, they have glasses. Probably a white beard. Surrounded by books. I envision a sweater vest when I think of, of wisdom, right? I just feel like, I feel like that is the, the sort of the, the drive that, that we're supposed to, to look at, right? Every time it's the professor type, and, and, and we can't help it. That's just what we go to when we think of wisdom, right? I wear contacts, and sometimes I, I have to switch them out and wear my glasses. And you know what people say to me every time I wear my glasses? Yeah, they, they say, I like your glasses. You look so smart today. 
and I'm, I'm not sure how to take that. I sort of wonder what I normally look like uh, when, when I'm not wearing my glasses, but, but here's the deal, right? It's just a natural instinct, or it's a reflex, because our world has a view of wisdom, and, and glasses are not, sweater vest or not, every single one of us should desire wisdom. We should pursue wisdom knowing this, that it is not a gathering of facts. It just isn't. If you look at verse 13, wisdom is a life lived doing good. Wisdom is good works done in humility and gentleness and meekness and understanding that, right? That, that alone, that's the goal of the text this morning, right? To help us see that, that wisdom isn't this head knowledge thing. Wisdom is a life well lived with the humility that can only come from Jesus. So as you and I know that we're called to pursue wisdom, we want to be wise, we want to live a wise life, let's make sure that we understand the difference between what the world says is wisdom and what God says is wise. And that brings us to our second point where we really get to evaluate the two, and that is simply understand wisdom. So all of us need to be pursuing godly wisdom, and as we go on that quest, we need to make sure that we understand it. Because in James, we see that there's two kinds. Look at verse 14. God's word says this, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. Remember, this is connected to verse 13. So if someone would say, hey, I'm wise, I've got it together, James is saying, listen, if you have have jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, you're living a lie, right? You're holding on to something that is not really wisdom. Verse 15, this is not wisdom that comes down from heaven above. It's earthly. It's unspiritual. And, and he says it's demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. As we evaluate these two wisdoms, we see here that, that this verse shows us earthly wisdom is selfish. Two main character traits of it. Jealousy and selfish ambition. So if someone claims to be wise, or if we are looking at somebody that we think is wise... And their hearts or their motives are driven by either or by both of these things, then God word, God's word says that they're living a lie, that it's fool's gold. And while they might look wise, they're, they're not holding on to a wisdom that is from God. Right? Think about those two traits bitter jealousy, right? It, it's just being self centered, and that it sees what somebody else has, and then what? It, it desires to have those things for ourselves. And, and that jealousy, it, it stops us from being content. It stops us from being grateful to what God has given us, and it always desires more. Right? It's this hunger that just can't be satisfied. Have you ever felt that right? or, or, or experienced that maybe even recently, like just seeing what somebody else has and thinking, man, I, I wish that I had that. I would give up all of these things if I could just have that. Students, you went back to school, right? That you saw somebody's clothes or shoes, and you're like, man, I wish that I had that. You see somebody with a specific car or a house or a vacation, maybe you just see the the influence that somebody else has on social media and you think, man, I I need to have these things and, and, and that could be a temptation for us because we live in an area where a lot of people put a lot of focus on material things. But as followers of Jesus, we need to ensure that our focus, that our hearts are in the right place so we're not caught up in that as well. And and selfish ambition, it's the second trait of this worldly wisdom. It's very similar. It's this concept where where we want to succeed and and climb the ladder for selfish motives. Maybe it's climb up in our class rank. Maybe it's climb up in our career or our our social status. And a lot of times the goal is the same. It's money, it's power, it's influence, it's notoriety, all with the end goal of being able to get what we want. And as we wrestle with that concept of selfish ambition, let me just go ahead and acknowledge that that could be tricky for us because ambition is fine, right? Ambition, godly ambition is a good thing, right? Selfish ambition is where we begin to get into trouble, right? We should do the best that we can in every situation. God's word says every time we work, anything we do, do it as we're doing it for who? It says that we're doing it as for the Lord. So anything in any area that is less than our best effort is wrong. But we're called to do it not for ourselves. We're called to do the best we can for the glory of God. That's different, right? That's different than the way our world would have us work. The world's eyes, the wise thing to do is to to accumulate stuff and money for ourselves. And if we're doing that, then the world looks at us and, and claps and says they're doing good. They're wise. They're successful. Look at how smart they are. But, but if that's our heart, if it is a selfish thing, if that's the goal, 
James says, listen, we're holding on really tight to something that just isn't real. We're holding on tight to something that is not going to get us where God would have us go. And, and in fact, James says, not only is that kind of wisdom not from heaven, look at what he calls it in verse 15. He calls it earthly, unspiritual, and demonic, right? That selfish way of thinking, it's not from God. James says that, that it's from the devil. And, and if you think about it, right, that, that's so incredibly true. I mean, go back to the Garden of Eden. The first two people that, that God made and placed on earth, he got Adam and Eve, and he placed them in paradise, right? In the Garden of Eden. And God gave them every good thing to enjoy. He said, here's paradise, and it is all yours. Tend the garden. Live in peace. Live in harmony. There's no sin. There's no sickness. There's no tears. There's no death. There is nothing bad. All it is is enjoying the goodness and the presence of God with one another forever. But what happened to them? Right, that they went from this place where they were living in godly wisdom to listening to someone else. The Bible says, and you can read it in the first couple chapters of the Bible, that, that the devil comes in. And what does he do? He, he twists their way of thinking. Right? He, he twists the wisdom that's from God and says, hey, God would never deny you something, would he? Look at the fruit on this tree, that this is good fruit. You'll enjoy this fruit. You deserve this fruit. Just, just take a bite. And the Bible says they looked at it, and it was pleasing to them, and it looked good to them. And, and so they rationalized it and said, I, I deserve this. This is a good thing for us. And they took a bite of the apple. And I just want you to think about what happened when they abandoned the godly wisdom and chose to, to live by wisdom that was from the enemy, wisdom that was from the devil. And it led to chaos in their lives. It led to sin in their lives. It, it led to death in their lives, right? It, it let them down in a major, major way. And, and guys, that's what happens, right? It, it's back to my kid in, in that sandbox. He was so excited. And then when he learned the truth, he was so let down. Okay, we, we can't be tricked. We, we can't be fooled thinking that, that, we're, that we're holding on to something good. Let's make sure that we're not pursuing something that, that our culture would call wise, that God's word tells us is wrong. Selfishness, it's not from God. It's the opposite of what Jesus modeled. And, and if you look at verse 16, it, it leads to something bad. Look at verse 16. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be what? Disorder and every vile practice. Have you seen any disorder, chaos, or, or sin in our world recently? I think that we could make a pretty strong case for that, right? That our world's been swimming in, in that kind of chaos and disorder for quite some time. And, and listen, where does that come from? It, it flows from selfishness. It flows from thinking that we're doing the right thing when, when really we're not, right? Selfishness is that foundation of earthly wisdom, and it's not good. It's not right. It's from the devil. As followers of Jesus, you and I must, we, we get to, we, we are invited to pursue godly wisdom. And so we need to make sure that we understand the difference between wisdom that's from the world selfish, and wisdom that's from God. James tells us that wisdom that's from God is pure. Look at verse 17. The wisdom that's from above is what? It's first pure. It is this pursuit of God that leads to every other attribute of the wisdom that we're going to see here. Wisdom that's from above is pure, then it's peaceable and gentle. It's open to reason. It's full of mercy and good fruits. It's impartial, and it is sincere, godly wisdom that's from above, right? It is from God. And the characteristics that, that we just read that, that are on display, that are a part of godly wisdom, they were on perfect display in the life of Jesus. You can go back through and read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, and this is Jesus, pure, peaceable, gentle, reasonable, merciful, bearing good fruit, impartial, and real, sincere, right? Let's just look through these and sort of make sure that we understand the true characteristics and attributes of godly wisdom. It's pure. What does that mean? Well, godly wisdom being pure means that, that it does not mess around with sin, right? Purity isn't thinking, what can I get away with? How close can I get to this certain line that I've got in my head? How close can I get to what God's word says? No, purity is running away from those things and running straight towards God every single opportunity that we've got, right? Purity is pursuing after Jesus. Godly wisdom is peaceable, 
right? It's not trying to start a fight, that there is no conflict in it. Jesus said what? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God, right? So our words, our actions in real life and online, right? That's important. Our actions and our words should lead and bring about peace, not chaos. Earthly wisdom leads to chaos. Earthly wisdom leads to sin. Earthly wisdom leads to disorder. Godly wisdom, man, it leads to peace. Godly wisdom is gentle, right? This is a big one for us. It's kind. It's tender. It's not brash. It's not abusive. And, and, and as I'm just sort of thinking through these, and we can't do this for all of them, but, but thinking through gentle, for me, a good way to evaluate the gentleness that's in our heart and that's in our life is just how do we respond to unfortunate situations? Or how do we respond to frustrating situations? Do we sort of explode and yell at the person that it's really not their fault, but, but they get the brunt of what we've got? Or are we gentle with them? Listen, I'll never forget, a, a couple of years ago, uh, Chelsea and I ordered pizza from the Pizza Hut at the front of our neighborhood. And I went to go pick it up, and, and I walk in about 10 minutes after it was supposed to be ready. She's laughing at me. I uh, went to pick it up about 10 minutes before it was supposed to be ready, and I'm just sort of hanging out in there. And I'm, I'm in there like 30 or 40 minutes, and, and I still don't have pizza, and all these other people are coming and going, and I'm getting texts from Chelsea saying the boys are about to burn the house down. They're really hungry. Oh, where are you with our food? And I, I legitimately thought that I was on a candid camera kind of thing, and they were just testing me to see how I was going to act. And so I'm relatively laid back, and, and you know my patience level is up and up and up and up, and it hit its point. And and you know I, I was sort of stepping into this earthly wisdom kind of phase here, and I was like... I, I need my pizza. What is going on? So I stepped up to the counter, ready to make a big deal about this, not, not in a gentle way like, like God would have us do it. And by the grace of God, and only the grace of God, nothing came out of my mouth. I said, excuse me. And the lady turned around, the, the girl that was working there was a teenager, and she said, oh my goodness. And I said, sorry? And she goes, are, are you Stephen Morris? And I was like, oh, thank God I didn't say that. Um... <laughs> And she was, I was like, yeah, I, I am. And she goes, I came to, to church for the first time in my life last Sunday, and I heard you preach. And I'm so happy to get to meet you in person. And I'm bringing my whole family back to church this next week. I'm so excited to get to meet you and have a conversation with you. And so it's one of those things where God reminded me, you were waiting here this whole time because I wanted you to go talk to her gently and lovingly, not, not out of frustration. And it's that thing, right? We're, we're really easily, right? We can just slip into our old habits and our old patterns if we're not focused on what God's called us to. Godly wisdom, it, it is gentle in situations like that. It is gentle with our spouse. It is gentle with our kids. It is gentle with our teachers and our kids' teachers and the people that we run into. Godly wisdom is gentle. It's open to reason. Keep looking at at verse 17 there. Godly wisdom is open to reason, right? It's similar to being quick to listen, which we see in James chapter 1, but it simply means that we're willing to hear others out, right? We don't listen just long enough to hear where they're coming from so we can argue with them. It, It means that we listen long enough so we can understand where they're coming from, so we can understand their heart. And, and I, would say that, I would say that godly wisdom is on full display in the world today right here. There's not many people that are open to reason. There's not many people that are open to have a conversation with somebody, even someone that they disagree with strongly, right? We can see godly wisdom on display with our reasonableness. Godly wisdom is full of mercy because we've been shown mercy by God even when we didn't deserve it. We are willing to show mercy to others even when they might not deserve it as well. Godly wisdom is impartial. Uh, It it sees everybody as who they are, fully made in the image of God and treating them in that same way. And then godly wisdom is sincere. What does that mean? It means it's not fake, right? it's, It's the real deal. It's true. It's genuine. It's not the fool's gold. It is pure all the way through. And now look back at the very beginning verse of this section, verse 13. Is anyone among you wise? How will we know? Let them show it by their good deeds done in humility. Right? Verse 17 is the list. Verse 17 is the good deeds that, that James is looking for, that he's using to describe 
wisdom. We, we've got to understand this, right? Godly wisdom is not on display. It is not shown in, in just the facts that fill our head, right? Godly wisdom is shown in how we live. Godly wisdom is just a life lived doing good things by the grace of God. Godly wisdom is doing the, the things that God would have us do in every situation with a humble heart. And look at where godly wisdom takes us in our life, down at verse 18. And a harvest of righteousness is shown in peace by those who do what? Make peace. Godly wisdom brings peace. Earthly wisdom brings chaos. Heavenly wisdom or godly wisdom brings peace. And, and with these two options, there's no question which one we would pursue. Man, if we have chaos and disorder in our lives, or if we could have peace and righteousness in our lives, man, we're taking peace every single time. And, and so as we think through that, my, my, my hope is that at this point your thought is, okay, it's clear what I need to pursue. It's clear what I want my life to look like. How do I ensure that godly wisdom is flowing from my life. I've got three things and, and then we'll close. But if you want to be full of godly wisdom, I, I think that if we did these three things that we would be well on our way. The first is very simple. It's just pray for it. If you look back two chapters in James chapter 1, James tells us, the Bible says, if you lack wisdom, ask God for it and he will give it to you generously without finding fault. So if you would say, hey, you know what? I, I'm just not sure where I'm at. I feel like I'm swimming in this chaos. I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure where to go and what way is up or down. Listen, God's word says, if you need wisdom or you want wisdom, ask God for it, and he'll give it to you. So pray for wisdom. The second thing I would say is this. It, it's read, read our Bibles. We know what Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says. It's don't lean on your own understanding, but trust in God with all your heart, right? Go to the word of God. And then Romans 12, 2 fits in that with that as well. And I want to read it just to sort of get our minds there. It says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So, so don't be conformed to this world and the wisdom of this world and, and the, the direction that this world's taking you, but instead allow your mind to be transformed. And then by testing, you can discern what the will of God is. Don't be like the world. Transform your mind with the word of God, and then you'll, you'll have godly wisdom. It says it's good, acceptable, and perfect, right? Allow your mind to be transformed by the word of God of God. Be in the Word of God on a regular basis. There's a, an email that goes out from CFPC every day with a devotional. If you're not reading the Word of God, start there, right? If, if you don't have another spot, go to the book of Proverbs, and, and there's 31 chapters in Proverbs. Whatever day of the month it is, just read that from the book of Proverbs to get started. But go to the Word of God for godly wisdom. And then the final thing is this, as we close, if you want to be wise, if you want to live a life that's full of godly wisdom, walk with wise people. Right? Bring other people that are full of godly wisdom into your life. We end up being like, acting like, living like the people that God has placed in our lives. Look at, at what Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says. Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. That's wisdom, right? We, we just talked about that. It's doing good things with that humble heart. Let us consider how to stir one another up to a wise life, not neglecting to meet to, together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day draw near. You want to be wise? Surround yourself with wise, godly people that will encourage you and help you to do the wise thing with your life. And a great way, of course, to do that is in a life group. A lot of them started today. Several more brand new groups will, will hopefully be starting in the next couple of weeks. But I just want to encourage you, make sure you're walking with wise people in your life and that you are connected to them. And, and they'll do what we see all the way back in James 3.13. We'll encourage one another to do good things from a humble heart. We want to be wise. We need to desire wisdom. We want our kids to be wise. We want our families to be wise. We want our church to to be wise, all of those things. And so as we consider God's word this morning, let's ensure that, that we are turning from selfishness and let's ask God to help us to walk in his wisdom because it's only there that we're going to find peace. And, and as we do and as we live in that peace, God's word says that we will bring that peace to the world around us. Earthly wisdom brings chaos. Godly wisdom brings peace. Let's make sure that we are wise in God's eyes. Would you pray with me? As we just take a moment to pray and, and, and reflect on God's word, I, I just pray this will be a moment where you sort of respond to it in your heart, where you think about what God's word tells us, and, and you would begin to think about, okay, well, what do I need to do in light of what God's word says? How do I respond to this 
this morning. And, and I think that there might be some people in here that would say, you know what, godly wisdom, it flows from God. And, and maybe, maybe I'm not in a relationship with God. And so if that's you this morning and you're saying, hey, you know what, the, the first thing I need to do before I can pursue that godly wisdom is I need to pursue God. If you would say that you're not in a relationship with him, I would invite you this morning to trust in him as you pursue that godly wisdom. And we'll have people at the front right up here by the baptistry that would love to pray with you after the service to show you what it means to live out this godly wisdom. And, and I would say for those of us that, that saw and heard the word of God this morning that might say, hey, you know what, there, there's this mix of selfishness that, that rears its head in my life. Maybe, maybe I grasp on to that earthly wisdom when I really am trying to pursue godly wisdom this morning, I would just say, hey, God, forgive me of that selfishness. Don't let me be influenced by what the world says is wise. God, just help me to walk with you and to pursue that godly wisdom. And that's my prayer for all of us, is that we would pursue godly wisdom as a church family through prayer, through time in the word, and through just simply encouraging one another. God, we love you and we thank you for your word. And God, I pray that, that we would be wise. God, wise, loving people. And not necessarily in the eyes of the world, God, but that we would live with a wisdom that comes only from you. And I pray that as we live that way, God, we'd experience what your word says, that we would experience that peace and that you would let that peace flow from us to the world around us. We love you and we trust you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.